We're going to talk about the Manhattan Project. Okay. Clouds over Hiroshima and the little boy and the fat man <clears throat> over Nagasaki. And one of the things you might not know is those were two different kinds of bombs. One was a uranium bomb. That was the one <clears throat> over Hiroshima. Fat Man was a um, plutonium bomb. I'm going to talk a little bit about the differences between the two. But in particular, what I want to talk about tonight is the role of a man named Dick Groves. Dick Groves was the project manager of the Manhattan Project. So what I want to do, and, and I would like to do it in less than an hour, is tell you the full story of the Manhattan Project expurgated and describe in particular Groves' role leading the project. I talk a little bit about Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer is given the credit for the bomb. And I hope that by the time you're finished with this program, you realize that the person who really deserves the credit, if anybody does, it grows. In 1933, before any of us were born, right, a Hungarian physicist named Luyo Szilard first realized the possibility of a nuclear chain reaction. They knew radiation, but they didn't know that you could take radiation and actually create a chain reaction. Szilard was the first physicist, and this is him with your old buddy, <clears throat> Einstein. However, and I want to make this very clear, it took an engineer to convert this discovery into the atomic bomb. The scientists wanted to be in charge of the program, and, and frankly, it never would have happened had that been true. Just talk a few minutes, maybe two, about splitting a uranium atom. I don't know if you understand what happens when a uranium atom splits, but a neutron strikes the nucleus of a uranium atom. It creates two atoms, kryptonite and barium. It also creates additional neutrons. That creation, the, the atomic numbers of those two that it creates, is different than that of uranium, and that difference becomes energy. So the first two split into two more, and what happens is they start creating multiple, multiple chain reactions. That's what an atomic bomb is. It's a uranium atom, multiple uranium atoms, splitting into smaller atoms and releasing a lot of energy. That's what Sizelard figured out theoretically, but he did not have any practical way of proving that. By 1939, there had been enough work done that Einstein was enlisted. To sit. By now, Einstein had been run out of Germany by Hitler, and he sent a letter to FDR, and he encouraged the United States to develop a nuclear weapon before the Germans did it. By 1941, FDR established something called the Office of Scientific Research and Development. It was on the 18th floor of a building in Manhattan, the Arthur Levitt State Office Building. That's what became the Manhattan Project. Before they were through, the project included many of the great American corporations of the United States, everybody from DuPont to General Electric and, and so forth. It also included a large number of scientists, I think five of whom were Nobel Prize winners. It included the resources of the United States government, in particular money and its military forces. And I'm going to talk a little bit about all of each of those as we go through this. But most of all, it required someone to lead this effort. And those of you who are familiar with the project 
the more you understand the complexity of this project, the more you can imagine how complicated it was to be that leader. That man was Lieutenant General Dick Groves. I'm gonna talk a bit about him as a person, but mostly I'm gonna talk about what he did. Groves was born in 1896 and died in 1970. He was the son of an army chaplain. He graduated from the military academy in November of 1918. And for those of you who know your history, 19, November 1918 was too late to become uh, involved in the First World War. Groves' class graduated in three years because they were accelerating classes not knowing how long the war was going on. Prior to the Manhattan Project, he was the Deputy Chief of Construction for the Corps of Engineers. His major contribution was he was the construction coordinator of the Pentagon. This was his training for the Manhattan Project. And if you can imagine, what it was like to do that project, how many different stakeholders you had, how many people wanted offices with such and such and so and so, how many people were going to need to be involved in, in operating the Pentagon. It is the largest single building in the world, office building. And, and that building, I, I just, I think we ought to have someone do a story on or a program on how the Pentagon was built because it had to have been extremely politically sensitive, economically, just fun to deal with. And then all those generals who wanted their axes to get ground. So that's where Groves was prior to the Second World War. And what he wanted for his contribution to the Pentagon was he wanted to be gay, become a brigade commander, an engineering brigade commander in Europe. That's what he wanted to do. Now, this is the description of the kind of person he was. He was the only person that this person knew who was as good as he thought he was, intelligent, perceptive, and an outstanding judge of people. These are two of his key subordinates. I'm going to talk quite a bit about Oppenheimer, and I'm not going to talk that much about Farrell. Farrell was his deputy commander. Farrell was also responsible for coordinating the work at Los Alamos. But Oppenheimer is the person who gets the lion's share of the credit for creating the atomic bomb, and I'm going to talk about what and how Oppenheimer got there. All right, by the summer of 1942, this is what the Manhattan Engineering District looked like. In laboratory tests, they had demonstrated the potential of controlled fission. There were many scientific studies in progress in a number of different locations. Nobody had proven it. All they had proven was the potential of nuclear fission. FDR formally authorized the Manhattan Engineering District with a budget of $85 million in 1942. There was a different person in charge of it that summer, and I can't even remember his name. It's pretty, pretty forgettable. And to be, to be very specific, the project was going nowhere. They had actually done some preliminary siting work on the project at Oak Ridge, but they had not acted on it. Simplistically, the project was stuck in what's called analysis paralysis. Nobody could make a decision to move the project forward. They turned around to Groves, the uh, chief of engineers, whose name was Sommerfeld, said, this is what we want you to do. Groves said, I don't want to do that. And he said, I didn't ask you if you wanted to do it. 
That's what your assignment is. And at the time, Groves was a colonel. First thing Groves said was, if I'm going to do this project, you've got to make me a general so that people will know that I'm important. Initially, the project had a double A priority in wartime allocation. So by 42, it was a double A priority. Radar, for instance, had a double A priority. Groves said, I can't get it done with a double A priority. He went to the board that set priority and told them they either gave the project a triple A priority or he was going to FDR and he was going to tell FDR, forget it. It's never going to happen because we got too many different things that are top priorities. They then raised the priority to triple A, which was the only triple A project in the uh, American war effort. Now, here's what his role included. First, procurement and refining uranium ore. We had no uranium ore. Fortunately, there was some uranium ore in the United States in a warehouse. So the first thing he did was he went out and bought all the uranium on the market he could find. The second part of the role <clears throat> is development and leadership of Oak Ridge, the Hanford Engineering Site, and Los Alamos Laboratories. All three sites were his personal responsibility. He made the critical decisions and then monitored what was going on and intervened when interventions were necessary. The third part of his role, and this is what most people probably don't know, he was responsible for formation of the Air Force 509th Bomb Group. He was responsible for training its for its missions. He was actually responsible for targeting the bomb. He had a small group whose mission was targeting. And I'll talk a little bit about that later on. And then the last thing was included in his role was supervision of a workforce that exceeded 130,000 people. And, and I, I, I have a project manager, had a project one time <clears throat> that had about 600 on it. I can't imagine what it's like to have a project with 130,000 people. Here's what the objectives were of the project. Three major projects. First, separation and production of pure uranium-235. That's not an easy thing to do from uranium ore. And also separation and production of uranium-238. Then secondly, the development and production of fission-grade plutonium-239 from uranium-238. And then finally, develop and use the bomb. Here are the challenges that they faced in the summer of 42. Controlled nuclear fission was not a proven concept. There was no fission grade material available anywhere. There was no such animal around. There was no proven method for refining fissionable material. They really didn't know how you're going to make it from the ore. There was no design, should you ever get enough fissionable material for producing an explosive device. No similar organization had ever been assembled anywhere to give him a template for such a project. Simply, it was the most complex project anybody had ever undertaken. What you see on the right is just the organization structure that Groves worked with. There was a policy group that, that uh, Groves was a part of, came down from the president through the secretary of war, the chief of staff, <clears throat> and then to Groves. And then at, below Groves was the whole project activity. Communications problems. Now, just think about this. I want you to look at this map I'm about to show you and think about how you keep this group of people in 1942, 43, and 44 
on the same sheet of music. This is where things were happening in the development of the atomic bomb. Oak Ridge, you know about. Richland, you know about. That's where Hanford is. Los Alamos. But all of these other sites, Chicago, Rochester, Berkeley, all of these other places where activities were taking place that had to be integrated into the production of the atomic bomb. Groves personally selected the production sites, Oak Ridge, Los Alamos, and Hanford as the three primary sites. He established at each site an engineering team, a production organization. For instance, he went, <clears throat> he went to DuPont and told DuPont he wanted them to run the operation out at Hanford. And they said they did not want the job. And he said, well, I want you to do it. The president of the United States wants you to do it. And I don't really want to go and tell the president that you don't want to do it. So they agreed. DuPont was suffering from some bad press from the First World War. So they wanted to stay out of this kind of operation. They also saw it as a something that wasn't going anywhere. They were, they got their contract, they DuPont agreed after a certain amount of arm twisting for $1 and costs. DuPont made no money from, for their participation other than having their engineers and whatever paid for. His temperament, I'm talking Groves now, and his, man, his manner did not <clears throat> make friends with the scientists. So what he did was he appointed Oppenheimer as director of the design laboratory and you have to hear a little bit about Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer was rejected by the FBI. They said he was a leftist. He had a number of communist groups that he had been participating in. They did not, they would not give him a security clearance and Groves turned around and said that's who I want to be the director of the, of the laboratory. Since I have a AAA priority, I don't give a damn what the FBI has to say about it. And Oppenheimer therefore got the assignment. Oppenheimer was not a Nobel laureate. He had five Nobel laureates working for him. He was a, a theoretician. He was not a practical scientist but apparently he was able to get the scientists to work together pretty well. Now let's talk some about Oak Ridge. I don't know how many of you have been to Oak Ridge. It was designated as the site for uranium processing in early 1942. The reason it was chosen, and if you've been up there at the time, it was very, very sparsely populated, but it did have highway and rail access. It had water availability, and most of all, because of the TVA, it had electricity. At one point in time, this site was drawing one sixth of the total electricity in the United States. The location kept the town a secret. The population grew from 3,000 in 1942 to 75,000 people by 1945. They actually built three plants to refine uranium ore. And it wasn't that they needed all three, it was they weren't sure which, there was a gaseous diffusion plant, there was a plant that was operating with centrifuge, and I forget what the third one was, but what they wanted to do was refine uranium ore and separate U-235 from U-238. George? It, yeah. Uh, I, Y-12 was electromagnetic. There That's you go. why they need electricity. Thank you, Owen. Appreciate it. I worked there for a year. Did you really? Fantastic. Yeah. The cost of this facility was $1.2 billion in 1942 money. 
Today, that would be $12 billion. Now, the U-235 that was produced at Oak Ridge was used to assemble Little Boy. That's the bomb they dropped on Hiroshima. The U-238 was sent out to Hanford to make plutonium with. And it was apparently the the uh, process was able to produce a sizable difference in U-238 compared to U-235. Apparently, it's very hard to get U-235 in its pristine state. That's why we went to plutonium. Hanford. Plutonium was a parallel path. Grove said, if I'm not sure which is going to work the best, let's do them both. So Hanford was built to refine plutonium from U-238. The DuPont Corporation was the primary contractor. It cost $230 million between 43 and 45. Just to give you an idea of the order of magnitude, it included 550 production buildings, three reactors, three 250 meter plutonium processing canyons, and 380 miles of road. It also included the city of Richland, Washington. I'm not sure what was there to begin with. Probably. Hey, George? Yes. Do you know why they picked Hanford? Why it's didn't they keep, to do with keep the same things that that uh, that Oak Ridge was? It had access to water. It had access to electricity, and it was in the middle of nowhere. And nobody knew about it. But they didn't want to put the two together. They couldn't put them in both in Oak Ridge. Uh, as far as I know, <laughs> they were they wanted to keep them separate in case they had a nuclear detonation. They wouldn't lose both of them. They, they wanted the electricity. That's the other reason. But I suspect they were also a little bit concerned about if you lose one of them for whatever reason, sabotage or whatever, the other one would not be affected. But that's a good question, Jerry. I haven't ever, ever tried to understand why was it necessary. I have Groves' book. It's called Now It Can Be Told. And if you want to read what an egotistical person thinks about his role in this project, it is really great reading because it's I did this, I did that, I did this, I did that a lot. He is he was not one to spread credit around liberally. He took a great deal of credit for himself. And he's the one who picked Hanford. Then the third area is Los Alamos. This is what Los Alamos looks like today. In, in 1942, studies on fission were being conducted at a several different universities around the country. Enrico Fermi produced the first chain reaction in a Chicago laboratory in December of 42 using plutonium. It was actually in a, in a, under a, a stadium, a very small, Skunk Works kind of laboratory. The Los Alamos laboratory was built to coordinate all of this scientific research. They brought these scientists together in one place and they were living in pretty primitive conditions by their standards. But that's what was going on at Los Alamos. Scientists and technicians were collected from all over the United States and in fact from all over what, what we thought of as uh, the allied world. There were scientists there from Great Britain, one of whom is credited with giving away the secrets to the atomic bomb. Klaus Fuchs was an English scientist and supposedly his clearance process was not as well vetted as Americans vetted American scientists and so he got in there with pretty serious Russian leaning. A general named Thomas Farrell 
was in command at Los Alamos. He was second in command to Groves, and he led the Trinity test. Now, here's something that, that you may or may not have ever seen. This is the difference between a uranium bomb and a plutonium bomb. They had a pretty good impress, a pretty good understanding of how to make the top one. That's the initial bomb design for uranium. All you do is you put explosives at one end and you drive the uranium together. It's called a gun type assembly method. They did not think that would work for plutonium, so they developed that second design because they had more plutonium for one thing. In that, what you use is implosion. Around the outside is all of, hello? Around the outside are all of the explosives. And when they go off, they, they actually concentrate the plutonium. They did not know if that was going to work until the Trinity site. But that's the implosion method compared to the gun assembly method. The bombs. The work at Los Alamos actually culminated in the creation of four atomic devices by July, August 1945. So that's how many bombs we had as we were getting ready to set off Trinity. The first one was used in the first nuclear test, codenamed Trinity, July 16th, 1945. It was a plutonium bomb. And the reason it was a plutonium bomb was they really needed to prove the theory that it was going to explode. If you've ever seen pictures of it, that's it up on the right-hand corner. That's not something you're gonna drop out of an airplane, okay? But that's the plutonium bomb. Supposedly at the site, there was a bet going of whether or not it was going to go off at all. It was also a bet going of whether or not it was going to ignite the atmosphere. It was, uh, it was a fairly uh, tense, situation. The next two bombs were military weapons, Little Boy and Fat Man. They were used in the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. After they dropped the bomb on Nagasaki, there was only one bomb left in the inventory, and that was not needed. A Groves had a production plan that by September, he told the president that he could be manufacturing an atomic bomb a week. That was what the plan was. Now, whether or not they were going to be able to do that or not, no one ever had to find out because it wasn't needed. This is what Trinity site looked like in 1945. Supposedly, uh, people in Las Vegas, which is what, 175 miles away, heard the detonation. I think that it was the, the blast was something like 20 kilotons. That's how they, they had soldiers watching it. I mean, they did not have any idea of what the radiation hazards were of it. I mean, they might've had on glasses, but they were watching it happen. Now, I want to talk about the 509th bomb group. <clears throat> hey, hey, George. Yes. This is Chris. Um, there's a book that you can look up on uh, on Wiki called The Jesus Factor. Yes. It was released in about 1970, <laughs> and it was written under the premise that the bomb would only blow up if it was stationary. If you dropped it, it wouldn't blow up. Oh really? And, and and it goes on from from that point and how that secret was maintained. It was very interesting, obviously fiction. I see. But it's called the Jesus Factor. Well, they knew that the uh, uranium bomb was going to work, or at least they had a very very high degree of confidence in the uranium bomb. 
but they still were not sure of the plutonium bomb. And you might be right. After after Trinity, they still had to put it into a into a casement and drop it out of an airplane. Mm. And in fact, and George, let's talk about how they did that. George, just a second. Sure. What I mean, what you're saying is they never did test the uh, the gun type bomb that was in the first uh, uh, in Hiroshima, and they did right. never did a test on that bomb. Nope, the, the, the test was dropping it. Yeah. Now, I don't know what they did in a laboratory. Okay, I don't know that they didn't do some things in a laboratory that gave them a high degree of confidence, but they certainly never de detonated one until it dropped on Hiroshima. 509th Bomb Group. It was formed under the direction of Groves. He's the one that organized this group. It was commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Paul Tibbets. Tibbets was Eisenhower's pilot. Where, how Groves figured out that he wanted Tibbets, I don't know. Anyway, he was in command of the 509th Composite Group. He was the man who dropped the first atomic bomb. I did not realize until I did some of this how big it was. It had an authorized strength of 225 officers and 1,500 men. It had a separate facility on Tinian. Part of the separate facility was where the bomb would go so that the B-29 could pick it up because there was no such process available. You had to put it down underground and then lift it up into the bomber. Tinian is 1,500 miles south of Japan. By 1945, it was the largest airfield in the world. And as I say, the uh, 509th group was totally segregated from the rest of the operations at Tinian. Groves also had overall responsibility for bombing missions. He started planning in May of 1943. A major decision was what are we going to drop this bomb on? They did not want to drop it on Tokyo because Tokyo had almost been bombed into oblivion to begin with. So there was a lot of work in deciding which cities are we going to use this on. Also, how many bombers are we going to send up? Because it wasn't just one bomber going by itself. They also had bombers that were taking photographs. They had bombers that were decoys, etc. Now, there were two candidates to deliver the bomb. The first was the British Lancaster. And the Lancaster, you might know by then, was actually using bombs the size of the atomic bomb. They had those dam busting bombs that they used. I think they were 10,000 pound bombs. No American plane had ever carried anything as large as the atomic bombs were. Not only that, the B-29 in its early stage was not a very reliable airplane. George, Hello? George, when you said never carried anything as large, is that size-wise or weight-wise? Both, both. The B-29 was never designed to carry an atomic bomb, and I, I might tell you a little bit about that. They had to modify the planes that they put into the 509th group specifically to carry the atomic bomb. An ordinary B-29 couldn't carry it. George, how, how much did the bomb weigh? Do you know? Somewhere in the 12,000, 10 to 12,000 pound range. It isn't just how much it weighed, it also is how big it is. If you if you look at the size of it, its diameter is, is, is something on the order of eight feet. And a bomb bay door won't carry, the bomb bay, the normal bomb bay doors would not carry it. Like I said, you could not lift it up from the ground because you couldn't get the bomber over it. So they had to build a pit, put the bomb in it. Eventually, 46 B-29s were designated for the missions. So they weren't anticipating that this was going to be a once and done. 
they were anticipating they were going to be doing it, like I said earlier, once a week until the Japanese gave up. Here's the Enola Gay in flight. Doesn't look any different than any other B-29, I don't think. The bombs. On July 26th, by now Truman knew what he could do. He knew what he had in his pocket. At Potsdam, they called for Japanese immediate unconditional surrender. And at the time, unconditional surrender was no conditions whatsoever. Then they told the Japanese, if you don't surrender, you're going to face total and utter destruction. And this message was sent to the Japanese. They refused to surrender. And supposedly their major refusal was about the emperor. They did not want to give the emperor up. First bomb was delivered to Tinian on July 26th aboard the USS Indianapolis. You all know what happened to the Indianapolis on its way home from delivering the bomb is when it was torpedoed. All aboard spent all that time in the water and all those people were savaged by sharks and whatnot. That's the ship that brought the first bomb to Tinian. The Japanese did not surrender after Hiroshima. On August the 6th, little boy was dropped. 70,000 people were killed by that blast and they did not surrender. On August the 9th, Boxcar, which was another B-29, dropped its bomb on Nagasaki. Nagasaki was not the primary target of Boxcar. Its primary target was a city called Kokura. But when they got over Kokura, they found that it was fogged in. They could not see it. So they had to go to Nagasaki, which was a secondary target. They did not hit the target that they were aiming for in Nagasaki. It still killed 40,000 people. Production plans forecasted another 20 bombs would be ready by the end of 45, but Truman told Groves, stop, enter Nagasaki. Allegedly, Truman said, I cannot go on killing civilians like this. On the 12th of August, he offered a new proposition to Japan. Surrender immediately. This is different than unconditional surrender. And the ultimate form of government shall be by the freely expressed will of the Japanese people. That's the one, that's the proposition that they took. So Japan surrendered, and Japan being the, the uh, emperor, he actually went on the air and he told the people that he was surrendering and that he expected them to surrender also. At the same time, there was a mutiny going on in the palace because the army did not want to quit. They wanted to fight to the death. Now, the last part is the rest of the story. With the surrender, Dick Groves was briefly a war hero. This is the press release, 1945. You can read it. A soft-spoken general emerged from the shadows. One of the world's great scientific achievements. At that time, more than 85% of the people in America approved the use of the atomic bomb on Japan. That has changed somewhat been affected by a number of different factors. And then the atomic in the question was what do we do with this bomb? Do we keep it in the military or do we civilianize it? And there was actually a very, very close vote in the Senate for forming a civilian atomic energy commission. Gross fought it tooth and nail. He said, if you give it to a group of civilians, the first thing you're gonna do is give it to the Russians. The rest of the world is gonna have it. There's not, not any way a civilian group of people is going to maintain 
security for this. He was not, he, I mean, he really made a, a big stink about changing it to a civilian organization. In fact, he did himself in by doing that. His last efficiency report, now this came from Dwight Eisenhower. I really think this is entertaining. The first part of it is the typical, he's a wonderful person. Then he says, his effectiveness is lessened because he often irritates associates. He has the extraordinary capacity to get things done. <laughs> what Groves wanted, What's he, talking about? he wanted to be chief of engineers. Okay, the Manhattan Project. And Eisenhower would not appoint Groves as a chief of engineers because he had not served in combat. Groves then left the army in 1948 and retired as a lieutenant general. He died in 1970. This is just a postscript. 1962, when Douglas MacArthur came to the military academy to give his farewell to the Corps speech, he was introduced by Dick Groves. So in 1962, he was, uh, I think, the head of the Association of Graduates, and he died in 1970. So that's the story of the Manhattan Project in 45 minutes. Questions? Is anybody there? Excellent presentation, George. Um, when I presented Truman a couple of three weeks ago, um, I was impressed at how many meetings and how many people contributed to the final decision to use the atomic bomb. Oh yeah, uh, it not it was not taken lightly at all. Uh, it took a lot of people over six weeks to come to the decision that they were going to have to do this. Yeah, um, and they were really concerned about what the future generations were going to say about us. Yep. And now my postscript is, after all this, Robert Oppenheimer became the father of the atomic bomb. Yeah. I don't know if anybody would like to argue that, but I don't think that's true. Oppenheimer was a very, very skilled scientist. He wouldn't have even been there if it wasn't for Grove. Any he's, other thoughts? Here's another factoid. I read that, this is Willard, I read that, uh, when the uh, emperor went on the radio to talk to the uh, Japanese people, that's the first time they had ever heard his voice. Yes, I heard that too. It was interesting, you know, wow. Yeah. I've also heard that it wasn't the bomb that made them quit. It was the Russians coming down through Manchuria and knowing they were coming down through Korea that made them decide they would be willing to fight the Americans on their own soil. They did not want to fight the Russians. I think that's what I think that's what the Russians want. That's the story they want to present. <laughs> that's that's their narrative. It might be. Yes, that's their narrative. They were Johnny come lately in every respect. Oh, I don't know about that. In, a, in the Pacific, they were. They sure as heck weren't in Europe. No, I'm talking. No, I'm talking about the Russians in terms of putting pressure on the Japanese. Absolutely. Yeah, they they didn't they didn't do diddly squat, and they were about to do something, maybe even possibly cut a deal where they would end up with half of the Japanese islands themselves. Right, right. Yeah. So. Well, I'm not I'm not taking up for the Russians, but they had they tied up a significant amount of Japanese soldiers along the Russo-Chinese border, and those were Japanese soldiers that could have been allocated to the Pacific. So. That's While true. they didn't engage them in a lot of active combat, uh, they did tie up uh, many divisions of soldiers. Well, and they, they, they did the lion's share of the fighting against the Germans. Oh, yeah, uh, absolutely. And suffered yes. horrendously. Yeah. But I, I would say this, the reason the Japanese fell apart was the U.S. Navy and the U.S. Army Air Force that... Uh, basically isolated them for the world that's what that's what that's what turned them into a basket case by the time we uh, had to make the decision as to whether to go in on an invasion or not 
there were people who advocated dropping the bomb off of the coast as a demonstration and not using it against a populated area. So that's part of the <clears throat> argument was, do you really need to demonstrate by killing 75,000 people? And I don't know that they knew what was actually going to happen on the ground, but they had a pretty good idea what was going to happen at Hiroshima. They, they looked at what had happened at Trinity and they anticipated it was going to be catastrophic. I read that the, their, their estimates for their, they had a plan for invading the Japanese islands, but they had, they had totally miscalculated the amount of, of resources the Japanese had available, like, like one quarter the amount of uh, forces the Japanese had available to repel them was like four times as much as what they thought. So the casualties would have been incredible. Looking at what happened at, at just looking at Okinawa, Right. Well, that by about 50, and that's what an invasion of Japan would have been like. Right. But apparently, it was it was all about the emperor. Yeah. Of them, they did not want to give up the emperor. I mean, he was God's gift to them, or something to that effect. I think they somehow phrased the uh, the, the the document to say that the emperor would report to the. Uh, the U.S. commander, but he still would be in charge of Japan. You know? But he would report to the U.S. commander, and that did the trick. You know, I've never seen the document. I, w I don't know how it reads. I do know that he was left, you know, in Germany, unconditional surrender meant that there was no German organization left at all. And that's what they were afraid of in Japan. So they left him. And it supposedly, now they did a movie a, a few years ago where MacArthur went through the process of deciding whether or not the emperor was guilty of war crimes. And basically they said that he was, that they were not going to prosecute him. Yeah. I think we were, I think we did the right thing with the Marshall Plan in Europe and uh, with, with although I'm not a MacArthur fan, with putting MacArthur in charge in Japan, there's a good book on that. If you guys, some of you guys hadn't read, called the Emperor's General, and it's about MacArthur's uh, activities and relationship with the Emperor after the war. I would recommend it if you're interested in that period of time and the dynamics at, at that time. But we we did the right thing there with those two those two uh, war theaters, I think. I think so too, Bill. Thank you. Well, back to Oak Ridge. Uh, <laughs> what uh, Leslie Groves did was he, con he created three competing uh, plants up there. X10 was doing the centrifuge. Y12 was doing gas uh, electromagnetic and K-35 was doing gaseous diffusion. Right. After, after the war was over, it was determined that K-35, the gaseous diffusion, was the cheapest way to uh, come up with U-235 and U-238. And so Y-12 went to be a parts manufacturer of right. MIRVs, and that's what I worked on as a cost accountant for nuclear weapons. And X-10 stayed in research, but they, when we went to the moon, they did a lot of stuff for the moonshot. Huh. And, and K-35, I was told, was became the largest building in the world for quite a while. But if you read the paper here about three weeks ago, they claimed to have cleared up to all the contamination at K-35 after 50 years of trying to decontaminate it. Yep, it's still a super fun site, isn't it? Well, they claim that it's now cleaned up, but a, a lot of that stuff through wastewater went into the Clinch River. Yes. And <laughs> if, you read, if you read the Tennessee Wildlife booklet that comes out every year, 
they recommend that you not eat any catfish or other bottom feeders out of the Clinch River south of where K-35 was. That's nice. And the Clinch goes into well, the Tennessee, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Is that going to Tennessee? And the, and the Emory River. I'm sorry, it's the Emory River that flowed by K-35. Uh, K but it, it flows into... The, flows into the Tennessee River at Kingston. Right. Okay, guys. Thanks very much.